Hello, everybody, and welcome to Community Forum. My name is Ron Vecchia, if you don't know by now. Uh, this is a forum where we have an opportunity to talk to people that are uh, making news within the town of Winthrop, and in this particular case here, the district uh, that includes Winthrop. And it's really a pleasure for me to introduce for the first time, uh, he's been on my show before as uh, Joey Boncori, but uh, this is the first time that I'm going to address him as State Senator Boncori. Senator, welcome to WCAT. Thank you for you're having not, me, Ron. Yeah, no stranger here. No, nope. and uh, in Winthrop, I'm still Joey, I guess. That's so right. So you don't have to. That's you right. can hold off on the senator. Tonight. That's right. <laughs> so, Joe was elected in his first district-wide run. Uh, he's run for uh, public office in the town of Winthrop. Uh, uh, you've been on the uh, the housing authority for yep. for years, and for about been, nine years. Yeah, and you've been involved in several committees I know and commissions and so forth relative to the town charter and so forth so he's not new to this by any means um, Joe did uh, dad talk to you and give you uh, advice before you started your, your run for a senator of course. I'm interested to know that yeah no he did of <laughs> course I mean uh, he always gives me advice you know um, even when I'm not looking for it yeah. but it's good I mean my father really has been a uh, obviously a role model for me as most people's fathers are but I yeah. can't imagine I would be in the position I am without him yeah. um, and his you know just growing up um, he was always about service whether it mm -hmm. was the JC's or you know ta Little League um, then certainly after the that sons of Italy. certainly the Sons yeah. of Italy on a national scale he was a national president right. um, and then obviously he's been a town councillor since the inception of the new charter so mm -hmm. you know public service was always something he uh, was passionate about right. uh, service to a greater good. He's instilled in me. It's a very important thing. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, he's always given me advice, but he's taught me to ha have my own opinion. Yep. So oftentimes, yep. you know, we agree on things, but yep. oftentimes we don't. And yep. he's, I think, happy that you know I'm my own person and have my own opinion. And uh, you know, it's just been great to grow up in a in a in a family really mm -hmm. that's dedicated itself to the town yeah. and to be able to be where I am and. Yeah look back and you know see the good work he still continues to do exactly you know, on the town council it's great yeah. and of course Nana is very proud of you oh my god I don't think her feet have touched the ground since <laughs> since May 10th when I was uh, formally elected yeah. it was really nice you know at my um, at my uh, my celebratory party on the night of the election um, with all you know when you win everyone's there mm -hmm. um, state officials were there party chairman McGee and state senate president uh, Rosenberg and a couple of the other senators and it was my grandmother that actually took the stage to introduce me is that right yeah and it was really you know it was it was kind of memorialized what my cam what mm -hmm. my whole campaign was about our mm -hmm. campaign was about yeah. it was about you know a, a grassroots level a very close-knit family and, cl and when I say family I mean you know my friends and you know mm -hmm. my f all across town that kind of came together and got me there. We mm -hmm. weren't, we are well touted by other politicians or well known politicians. Mm -hmm. You know, it was really a grassroots organization. Yeah. Very impressive win, to say the least. Thank you very much. Very impressive win. Well, today you'd be interested to know that um, a, a, a guy that we went to school with, your father and I, um, his grandson is directing the show. Yeah. And, uh, I saw him on the way in. Yeah. Little Johnny Cataldo. Little Johnny Cataldo. Yeah. Boy Scout in town. His yep. family's a good family. The father's a great guy, builder in town. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. So, what's the experience been like so far? You know, it's really been incredible. I mean, I just, people ask me, how do you feel? And I, I feel lucky to be able to do what I do and uh, get up every day and, um, you know, do the good work of the Commonwealth and really this town and my entire district. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's been a, it's been a whirlwind. I, I came in, I was sworn in May 21st, uh, the same day as the Constitutional Convention. Uh, so they swore me in that day and I, you know, right away I was voting in the Constitutional you Convention the in the running. House and, yeah. you know, within an hour and then, you know, it was, we were right into the budget um, mm -hmm. and anyone with any experience on Beacon Hill t can tell you that the budget yeah. week or is just, you know, it's really, it's a lot. Um, but it, it, it was great, you know, mm -hmm. I had a great, I have a great staff, um, I have a lot of good friends up there. Um, to you know, help me get to where I need to be, and you know, my budget amendments were due the day I was sworn in. Uh, but luckily, I didn't have opposition in the general after the primary special mm -hmm. election. So my staff, I was able to put together a great staff and work on some budget amendments that will benefit the town yeah. and the Good. district in general. Good. Good. Yeah. Have you like set priorities for yourself as a senator in terms of what you <coughs> feel that you need to do to represent the district? Absolutely. I mean. 
uh, not only in this district, but across the 351 cities and towns in Massachusetts, um, the opiate epidemic is just, it's, it's right there in front of us. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we've done incredible things, um, or the legislature has done great things, along with the governor, um, in passing legislation um, in regards to um, substance abuse recovery. Um, but I think, you know, that's something that we still need to work on, and mm -hmm. it's something I know I'm continuing to work on each and every day. Um, education's obviously of an importance in ensuring that, you know, all children in the Commonwealth have access um, to education, you know, as, as young as three years old. And mm -hmm. I'm talking about a pre-K education right. type system. I mean, education in our society is a great equalizer. Um, and if we can put every child on an equal playing field mm -hmm. um, at age three or four, right. um, you know, we'll see, you know, we'll see those, you know, investments pay dividends down the road mm -hmm. because, you know, any child with a pre-K education has twice the likelihood of going to college um, or higher education after high school. Right. Um, and not only that, but ch children who are educated at a pre-K level have a half as less likely chance to wind up going through the judicial system, which brings me to my third priority mm -hmm. um, is um, criminal justice reform. Um, I've been a public defender um, as while working in my family law practice for the past three years, and I've really seen the need Mm -hmm. um, I've seen what's going on in the court system. I've seen that the court system um, is not really doing what it was set up to do. Um, court system was obviously set up to, um, you know, be a just place for criminals to be dealt with. Right. Um, so many of the defendants before judges in, you know, East Boston Division of the Boston Municipal Court or Chelsea District Court, which is the other major court um, in my district, they're not criminals. Mm -hmm. You know, these people are the mentally ill in our society and with, you know, ment um, you know met with mentally ill hospitals and, you know, things of that nature shutting down. Right. Um, there's nowhere for these people to go. These right. people, when they shut down hospitals and, mm -hmm. you know, state hospitals, um, you know, those people don't just vanish. Right. They just become part of our, the fabric of our society. They become the homelessness. Mm -hmm. They become the addicted. Right. Um, so, so many in the court system now are either homeless um, they are addicted. I would say, you know, more than more more often than not, they're they're people who are suffering from serious mental health issues yeah. that, you know, unfortunately, uh, we're having a tough time dealing with. Yeah. So that would, you know, that that rounds it up, and that's what I'm thinking about as we're about to file legislation for mm -hmm. uh, the next session. That's good. I, I know that uh, East Boston District Court, um, the Chief Justice has has got a new program relative to, you know, people that are, that are arrested on drug charges, you know, maybe they've uh, yeah. an opioid, they've overdosed or, or they've, you know, they were um, caught shooting up or whatever the case may be. And before it was treated even by the police department as, uh, okay, let's get this person and throw them in jail and, and so forth. Now they have that different approach, uh, mm -hmm. the town of Winthrop uh, under the leadership of uh, uh, police chief uh, Delahanty. They've got a new program where they, they, go, to, they go to a drug court yeah. and, they, and they seek to help them instead of punishing them. So Judge McDonald, Judge McDonald, who's the first justice in East, the East Boston Division of the Boston Municipal Court, invited me to the drug court graduation just Did Tuesday. He really? Yeah, okay. and it was really a great process to see. You know, I, I was a public defender, mm -hmm. um, and you know, some of my clients are in the drug court, and you know, and I, they weren't in the drug court when I when I had left them, but right. they've uh, found their way into the drug court which has really been a helpful um, program for mm -hmm. all of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a drug court graduation. One of, the, one of the participants graduated. It was just really great to see, yeah. um, you know, the court be a, you know, a place of compassion. Yeah. I think so many people who have been brought up in the court system, unfortunately, mm -hmm. um, dealt with a very different court system, yeah. you know, maybe five years ago, but definitely 10 and 20 years mm -hmm. ago. You know, it wasn't a place of compassion. But now with the probation department and the judge and the police officers working together, um, you know, we're getting people on the right start and we're starting to lift people up, mm -hmm. you know, rather than just lock them up. And because they're not a drain on course. the economy in terms of the state of Massachusetts because they're not incarcerated. And they, you know, they're better off. Absolutely. You know, yeah. and just we need to, we need to continue in that trend and yeah. that's what we're talking about at the legislature yeah. and you know we see it in this district uh, in this town rather in Winthrop with programs like uh, the recovery coaches through mm -hmm. CASA. Mm -hmm. uh, today I was uh, opened up a well I didn't open it up but the, the city of Revere along with Mayor Rigo opened up um, a SUD initiative which is um, substance use 
and disorder initiative. Mm. Um, so they're changing the paradigm. They're not mm -hmm. looking at it as you know yep. addiction. They're looking at yep. substance use disorder because right. it is a disorder. It is absolutely. You know, it's a mental health mm -hmm. um, issue that we mm -hmm. need to deal with, yep. and we need to stop looking at addiction or substance use um, as a as a crime mm -hmm. when it's really a, a mental state. Right. Exactly. Um, we talk about the new, well, let's talk a little about what's going on as far as the election <coughs> in this uh, presidential race. Yeah. Um, I was at town hall for a meeting, uh, I think it was yesterday or Monday. I, I lose track because I've been at so many meetings. But um, they started this early voting. Yes. And 200 people had voted at town hall already. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's, it's something good. It's, it's different. It's uh, something, this is the first year we're doing it. Mm -hmm. I guess other states have done it in the past. Yeah, about 38 other states have early voting. Mm -hmm. um, that's, it's a, something they do, they legislate it for. Massachusetts just recently legislated to mm -hmm. open up the pro polls early, mm -hmm. a couple weeks before election. It removes a lot of the impediments people typically face when yeah. going to vote. Um, you know, so many in our, you know, in my district, uh, work two and three jobs. They take public transportation. They leave the house at six and six a.m. Mm -hmm. They don't get home till ten p.m. Mm -hmm. um, you know, voting day, their their schedule remains the same. Right. Um, what this does is it gives that person or people like um, in similar similarly situated the opportunity to get out and vote. Mm -hmm. You know, any day. Right. Uh, I know a lot of people will have intentions to vote on their lunch hour uh, because they're at work. But, you know, when you go to on election day, you're on mm -hmm. your lunch hour, you could be in line for two and a half hours. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, with this opportunity, you may be able to go the week before in your lunch hour and get out and vote. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really a great thing. I was in Boston at City Hall on Monday when they opened it up, and there was a line out the door. Yeah. Uh, people are really taking to it. You know, you never know what the weather is going to be like on election day. You never know what's going to happen in everyday life on election day. Mm -hmm. So it really broadens the um, ability yeah. of people to yeah. get out and vote. I agree with which you. Which is so important. <laughs> Without getting into the candidates, mm -hmm. you just your, <laughs> your feeling about the presidential race in general without yeah. getting involved with discussing candidates you know the the president the presidential uh, you know election in this country is the most important election that that we have um, I think that people are becoming a little dissatisfied uh, with the vivitrol being spewed between the candidates and what we see on TV every day um, doesn't it's really turning a lot of people off that mm -hmm. I'm talking to mm -hmm. um, and people will often ask me you know what well, I'm not even gonna vote well you know, the president is much as important as this presidential election is because mm -hmm. um, there's so much at stake, right? I mean, there's a good likelihood the next president's going to appoint the next three Supreme Court justices. Right. So whether we have that president for four years or eight years, mm -hmm. we're going to have their policy and their mindset mm -hmm. uh, on the Supreme Court for decades to come. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's very important we get out and vote. But not only is the presidential race on that ballot, there's many races on that ballot. Congress mm -hmm. is on that ballot. Mm -hmm. uh, representative, um, state representative, um, state senators on that ballot. So there are more races that affect people's everyday lives yeah. uh, than the presidential race. Yeah. You, you know, we have a unique situation in Massachusetts. You've got a governor, a Republican governor. Yep. You've got a Democratic uh, speaker. And I believe that the senator, uh, president of the, the president of the Senate, he's also a Democrat, am I not? He is. President Rosenberg okay. is, is a Democrat. Why don't we show them in maybe uh, Washington how to get along? Because, I, I mean, I see these things, whether it's the budget, uh, I see the cordiality between, um, let's say, Bob DeLeo and, 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 our, and our governor. And it's like things are happening. Right. I mean, there's... You, you disagree on certain things, but you approach it in a certain way, a mm -hmm. tasteful way. On the national level, it's been a negative thing for the last, what, 15, 20 years uh, about trying to get things done. So how, how, do, how do we get people to change? How do you get elected officials to change that are in the system as long as they've been in Washington? Yeah, I mean, it's tough to get uh, elected officials to change. I mean, unfortunately, on a, on a national scale, we do see um, an undue monetary influence in politics. Um, you know, in the Citizens United decision that came down from the Supreme Court that said that uh, money was speech and essentially, mm -hmm. you know, you can donate as much as you want to a political candidate. I mean, it really brings, um, you know, 
the business end of things into politics. And I mm. think that's one thing to point to, to say, you know, we need to keep money out of elections mm -hmm. so we can keep money out of politicians or elected officials, as, yeah. I, like, as I like to say. Uh, so they're doing what they think is right. Yeah. And, you know, I'll, you know, being, um, you know, passionate about your issues is one thing, uh, but I, we need to be practical as elected officials and leaders of you know this state or this country mm -hmm. because we got to get things done right. and there's a lot of give and take to get things done and unfortunately we've seen so much gridlock in Washington um, I mean we can't even get a Supreme Court justice appoint uh, yeah. you know confirmed yeah. um, they won't even and like the Senate won't even take a vote and it's not to say that they should vote them up or vote them down right they but they don't even want to do it they don't even want to take a vote yeah. you know and it's like, it's just unfortunate um, but I will say to your point uh, much of what you see on the federal s stage is not go what's going on um, and affecting Massachusetts politics. Mm -hmm. And Beacon mm -hmm. Hill is a very congenial group. Uh, everyone works very well together because we know at the end of the day we have to do what's best for the people of the Commonwealth. Right. Right. Well, that's a positive thing. Let's talk about the ballot questions. If, you, if, if, if There's four of them that we're concerned with in, in the town of Winthrop uh, statewide, and I guess there was a fifth one in, in Boston. In Boston, yeah. yeah. So the first one is relative to what? Slot machines? Yeah, so the first one is... Um, I thought is, we've already fought this battle. <laughs> we have. Um, and the legislature did a lot of work back in 2012 and into 14 to uh, build a comprehensive um, gaming law. Mm -hmm. um, and that gaming law called for um, two resort-style casinos in the state of Massachusetts and one slot parlor. Um, unfortunately, in my opinion, a group um, in Revere has prospected a site on Route 1A, and they intend to, or their, it is their intention, to get a slot parlor license. Is that the old Wonderland? Um, no, so it's not Wonderland or Suffolk. What it is is um, if you're traveling up McClellan Highway, yeah. um, there's Suffolk Downs. Beyond that, there's a trailer park currently. And, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. The idea is to uh, buy the property there and mm -hmm. develop a slot parlor. Now, there's a lot of problems with that, right? <laughs> Um, the, there's no license available for mm -hmm. a slot parlor. The slot parlor license, the so one in Massachusetts, has already been designated for uh, Plain Ridge, mm -hmm. um, and that's the that's slot parlor that's up and running. Um, the city officials in Revere um, have all, for the most part, come out and said that they don't want a slot parlor in Revere. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it would, it would be a detriment to that right. area of town. When we were talking about you know, resort-style casino in Suffolk Downs in that same vicinity or location. Mm -hmm. You know, we were talking about a group that was coming in on a full-scale resort-style casino was going to bring entertainment venues and right. restaurants right. and so on and so forth. But beyond that, they were going to invest greater than $60 million into the transportation and highway infrastructure of 1A. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're so close to the airport. We have traffic there. Mm -hmm. It's a corridor to get into Boston right. from the North Shore. And we really, without without changing the existing transportation infrastructure, mm -hmm. we just can't have it. Right. Um, you know, and it, it, it's really a bad idea to put a slot, a slot parlor there, in my opinion. I mean, the one slot parlor in, in Plain Ridge is, has 50% of its projected revenues. They projected revenues to be X, yeah. and they projected the state would get X amount of money, the host community, surrounding communities mm -hmm. would get so much money, and they're 50% below their benchmark. Really? And that's before resort-style casinos are even built at this point. Yeah. Resort style casinos are now being built mm -hmm. and they're gonna come online. Mm -hmm. But what that what's that gonna do to the slot parlor in Plain Ridge? Yeah. Probably lessen, you know, the economic development it thought it was gonna yeah. bring. And so if we this have passes, Joe, it, it, does this become law? I mean it, it's a reality? No. So if this passes, um, what will happen is the it, Although it'll be it'll be refer, re, a referendum by the people, mm -hmm. uh, it and it, it becomes a law, right? Uh, we still have to, the Gaming Commission ultimately will make the decision as to whether or not to issue another license. Okay. Um, so that's the issue. And I just so think it's a bad idea where we're three miles away as yeah. a crow flies in Everett, we're going to have a full-scale <laughs> casino. Um, I just, what, I don't know how that other slot parlor um, is going to flourish. And I would, you know, remind everyone that Revere took a vote mm -hmm. um, about a week ago. And overwhelmingly, at a two to one margin, the residents of Revere right. voted that they don't want it. Right. So now this is on a ballot question, it's on a referendum ballot, and the whole Commonwealth is going to be able to vote on question one hmm. to spot zone a slot parlor in Revere when the people of Revere don't want it. 
It's just a backwards question, and uh, I hope everyone <laughs> votes no. Okay. Uh, question two, and that's about um, charter schools. Yes. Um, I guess the governor just recently came out for it, mm -hmm. and so did the Speaker DeLeo, which I was really surprised. He did. Yeah. Yeah. And what, in effect, would, would that do? Yeah. So the charter school question um, has been a question for the legislature for, you know, the past two sessions. And essentially the new question would uh, mandate that 12 new charter schools come online right now uh, or in the, next, in, in the next year in places where they're needed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, then this is this kind of speaks to why I, I'm not a huge fan of ballot questions. But I think we elect the legislature to go out and make these decisions, mm -hmm. um, and they do, and they do it in a very comprehensive and um, you know fully thought out way. Well, you know, when we have a when we have a bill in front of us, we hold hearings, we have experts come before us and tell us the numbers and statistics, mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately. Uh, we couldn't, I know the legislature couldn't get to um, a, an education bill regarding charters um, in the last session. So now what we have is a ballot question in which a, a pro-charter group has put forth this ballot question. Um, and this ballot question is really going to serve as a, as, a, as, a, um, as a litmus test for the rest of the country. The, Massachusetts will be the first, mm -hmm. um, the first state in the union to to um, legislate in this way on charter schools. So what we're seeing now is undue influence again from states like New York. New York City um, has a big charter, pro-charter movement. States like California have a pro-charter movement are pouring money in commercials that you and I see every day mm -hmm. and giving people you know, some of the information. And on the other end, it's happening the same way. They're spending yeah. a lot of money on it. I am uh, against uh, lifting the cap at this time. Mm -hmm. um, I've sp spoken to my school committees in the areas that I represent. Um, I've spoken to the Winthrop School Committee. I've spoken to the Revere School Department, their superintendent, Diane Kelly, obviously in Winthrop with John Vicero. Mm -hmm. um, and I've had some really uh, long talks with the mayor of Boston, Marty Walsh, mm -hmm. uh, who is against the charter, who is against lifting the cap, as well as Senate President Rosenberg, mm -hmm. uh, who are against lifting the cap because it's the cities and towns can't not absorb at this time um, charter schools. Um, they're trying to do less and more just to keep the public school system running the way it is. And that's going to, a charter school is going to divert funds from the public school system to a charter school system with no oversight. Those, mm -hmm. charter, those charter schools will not fall under this, the school committee. Mm -hmm. um, when a child goes to ch a charter school, that money will come out of the school committee's budget and follow that child to whatever school they go to. Right. Um, so I think it, with the revenue the way it is at this time, um, I, I, I hope... <laughs> Uh, the citizens of Massachusetts will be, you know, patient mm -hmm. uh, in voting no on question two and letting the legislature think about a comprehensive education bill in the, ne right. in the next session. The, um, on, on the charter school, I mean, it's a little different, a charter school. It, it's, you know, they, they play it off to be that, you know, this is going to help kids that can't get a, an education within a regular public school system, a good public school system. But... I mean, I don't think they're, they're, they're lined up to be that great as they say they are in terms of providing extra activities for the kids and so forth, uh, especially if there's a special needs child. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't have the type of uh, mandated laws uh, that govern a public school system uh, that govern them. Right. So, so consequently, there's, there's a loss, in, in my opinion anyway, from what I've seen. And we yeah. did a little work, uh, we did a little research on it, because uh, as a member of the school committee, we did vote, you know, against this. Um, and the other thing, I was under the impression that some of the teachers don't have to be certified, which is yeah. kind of an interesting So thing. there's a different standard for, yeah. for teachers um, yeah. at a charter school, and there's different standards for charter schools. You know, mm -hmm. charter schools, you know, unfortunately, um, don't take their fair share of um, e ELL learners, mm -hmm. English as, uh, language learners. Right. They don't take their fair share of students with disabilities. Mm -hmm. um, and right now, it's, it funds about 3% of the entire student population in the Commonwealth. Yeah. That's what charter schools serve. Right. And even if everyone on the waiting list get at, got into a charter school, mm -hmm. you're still only talking about 6 to 7% of the entire student population. Right. We need to be concerned with the 93 percent of mm -hmm. students mm -hmm. in our Commonwealth. Right. You know, we have right. an issue where you know these these um, schools are opening up. Um, you know, they 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 tend to serve, um, or they say they serve disadvantaged children, but they serve disadvantaged children whose parents enroll them in the school. 
You know, it, you have to enroll your child into a charter lottery to get involved. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm really concerned with the students whose parents don't take that initiative yeah. or don't know about, in, you know, an enrollment mm -hmm. into a charter school. You know, if there was open enrollment in charter schools, I, I maybe will take another look at it. But yeah. at this time, in this climate, you know, I'm, I'm asking people to vote no. Okay. Question three. That's about free range chickens. Free range, yes. It's basically uh, a law that they're asking to be adopted whereby um, animals like chickens and pigs and stuff like that would not be confined to, to cages yeah. and so forth. Right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I, I can't see this question not passing. Yeah. Um, I think it's going to be, it's a good thing. I, you know, I think that the, the major provider for eggs in Massachusetts, um, you know, their farm, uh, it's out west. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually in Senate President Rosenberg's district. Um, you know, they know it's coming, um, and it's, you know, it's, it's going to be, it, it, it is going to pass, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's the other side of that coin is that the cost of um, building bigger cages, uh, the cost of letting, um, you know, chickens and pigs range free, which they should. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm in agreement with that. Mm -hmm. You know, that comes at a greater cost. That yep. cost is going to be passed off on the consumer. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, because we're not legislating it, yep. you know, and because it's going to be a referendum, um, we, there's little we can do on Beacon Hill about it. Yeah. And that's kind of the pitfall with some of these charter questions. And, yeah. you know, I support this. I'm going to vote yes. I think, mm -hmm. you know, animals, you know, should have their rights to roam as they, about as they might. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because there's, there's many egg companies that they, their eggs are a little more expensive when you buy a dozen of eggs, but right. it's free range or they're, they're cage free or they're treated differently. So, right. you know, obviously there's a market there for it. Yeah. So, you know, but right. everyone's going to have to buy into that market whether you want to or exactly. now because exactly. there's not going to be an egg that's exactly. less money. All right, and the last one is, is question four, uh, which, is, which is really um, an interesting um, uh, question that I asked you yeah. when you were running for state senate, mm -hmm. and it, it's relative to uh, the legalization of marijuana. And uh, where do you stand on that? You know, so I'm voting no on question four. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's not something the Commonwealth's ready for. I think that the test kitchens we've seen in Colorado and California, you know, the data, ha the data from, those, um, from those states hasn't convinced me. I know it's a great, you know, tax benefit to the state, millions mm -hmm. and billions of dollars mm -hmm. pouring in now. Uh, but, you know, I, I don't think we can take the money and look the other way on what it, the harmful effects it could yeah. be having on children. I mean, we're talking about a new industry that's going to be coming into Massachusetts. And I might say, I mean, it's polling ahead. Yeah. Uh, so it's, yeah. it's looking like if it would have happened today, it, would, it yeah. would pass. But, you know, without money set aside from that to go towards education of children on mm -hmm. um, the harmful effects of marijuana as a gateway drug, um, or even, you know, you, you know, use of marijuana before the age is, you know, fully developed, uh, yep. before the brain is fully developed, can have detrimental effects on, on adults um, and young, yep. young adults in America and in yep. the Commonwealth. And I just, you know, I'm, I'm concerned about certain things. I'm concerned about edibles, mm -hmm. um, which is marijuana in a form of a, you know, a lollipop, a, a cookie, a brownie. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you know, it's, it's just going to make it more accessible to, to a younger generation. Yeah. Um, so I'm concerned that, you know, and again, with the ballot question, we ha we're in a situation where the legislature isn't hearing from, mm -hmm. you know, officials and um, experts on the matter. Right. Um, a pro-marijuana group, for lack of a better term, wrote this question, got it on the ballot. And if this passes, Massachusetts will have the lowest tax rate of any state in the union on, on recreational marijuana. So we're not going to see the same benefit that mm. Colorado and, yeah, and California saw. Yeah. So I just think... You know, I, and I'm not to say I'm, you know, my head's not in the sand. I mean, I mm -hmm. do see, um, you know, marijuana becoming legal over the next 10 years. Um, but, you know, just I, I don't think we're ready for it. I, I, and I, I can tell you that. the legislature's not ready for it because yeah. it's not something we've dealt with. And yeah. it's going to be have to, we're going to have to be reactive. Mm -hmm. And reactive le legislation is, you know, is often problematic. Yeah. Well, I, I, I totally agree with you uh, opposing it. I, I mean, I am firmly believe that it's a gateway drug, and I, you, you've seen it where I've been involved with so many uh, programs with, with Linda, my wife, yeah. relative to CASA and all these, you know, uh, opioids and so forth. Nine times out of ten, when you talk it to a person that's been involved with drugs, that is the gateway drug. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the first thing they go to. 
And uh, one of the other things I thought of when I read this question uh, the other day was uh, the unfortunate incident that happened on the turnpike uh, last year. A state trooper was killed when he was hit from behind by, a, by a, a, a driver that was under the influence of marijuana. Sure. And so those are the types of things you have to think of before you make a, a determination whether you're going to vote yes or not. Yeah. Well, we're just about out of time, but uh, Joe, you're invited to come back at any time. Uh, maybe we can do this uh, on a monthly basis so when you have an opportunity to come in and talk about, especially if there's something that you really uh, you want to get across to the public relative to a, a bill or, or some type of an issue that's important to you and important to the district. Just give me a call. We'll have you on. I appreciate that. I appreciate, you know, WCAT for having me. I appreciate for you, uh, not only for the show, but for all you do in town with your involvement in the school <laughs> committee, which I know you're doing very well with. And yeah. um, beyond that, Kaiser and, uh, you know, you and Linda are invaluable to this town and getting that message out and creating a safe haven for uh, some, of, some of the people in Winthrop who are living in the shadows mm -hmm. and bringing them out and doing your best to, you know, end the stigma. So thank you. Thank you. Well, we've been talking to Joe Boncori, our state senator. Until next time, this is Ron Vecchia. Thank you for watching.